what to do before the judge. Any questions about that? Okay, I'm going to review it one more time. You go into court, anything that happens you don't like, all you do is I object. Why do you object? It's not my wish. I don't wish it to be that way. I don't wish that you make that motion or you, that you grant that motion. If he says that the best you can do, then you're, den you're overruled. Say, well, for the record, I do object. Don't argue, nothing. Move on to the next point. The judge will love you for it. Okay? That, that's the professional way, the proper way to handle it. You don't argue in court. You just simply make your very simple statement, I object. Then when you get back to your paperwork, back to your typewriter, your word processor, you issue the order reversing whatever he did. Okay? That simple. Also another thing is, when you're in, in if, if you are being subject to their proceedings, their overrooting, one of the things that you can do is you can demand to be released. Okay? Now whether he does it or not is another question, but you know, you want to be released from the jurisdiction. So that's the other thing you say in court, is that uh, I demand that I be released from the jurisdiction. Now, they may ignore you, but it's important that you make the demand. Okay? Because you put the judge now in a position of, well, maybe he's going to, he's breaking the law. He might know he's breaking the law by keeping you in jurisdiction. Okay? Okay, yes? What if, from the get-go, they will not allow you to even speak? If they won't allow you to speak, just make that clear in court. In other words, you speak. And then he shuts you down. He says, say one more word, you'll be in contempt of court. You've heard that somewhere before, haven't you? Sure. Say one more word, you'll be in contempt of court. Okay, Your Honor. <laughs> That's right. But you know, you, you say, because now... It's clear, it's a railroad job, right? So, not a problem. Because when you leave that court, what are you going to do? You're going to put it on the record with your orders. And you don't even say object that one word? Well, when he, if he says say one more word... Then you're out. You say, okay. Just remain silent. I mean, you, that's, he issued the order. Look, he's got the guns. All right? You know, remember, don't, don't get, don't allow yourself to get into the mindset of, of doing battle with these people. It's just the other way around. With that one exception that you do object. Otherwise you'd be cooperative. Whatever he wants. Okay, you know, say it with a smile. Okay, Your Honor. You know? No, you're, you're not here to commit suicide. Okay? That's not your purpose. You, this this should be a this should be a friendly thing. You want to you you want to survive this process, and uh, you know there was um, I got to tell this little story which is on here. It's it's somewhere on that uh, website and CD. Everything that's on the website is on the CD. But on the website it says uh, there's a story about this um, Buddhist monk, and. It was, uh, I think, a little after or during the Vietnam era. These uh, Buddhist monks were throwing kerosene on themselves and setting themselves on fire, burning to death. And that was a tremendous embarrassment to the government. Now, the government had a standard way. I think it was, uh, was it Thailand, I think, or one of those countries? Was it in Vietnam as well? But anyway, they, they had a standard way of dealing with problems, okay? All they did was uh, whoever was causing the problem disappeared at midnight. Okay, that's all, no problem. But the, the Buddhist monks had a leader and it was clear that this leader was responsible for this. He was the one who was encouraging the monks to do the suicide missions, okay? And he was a tremendous embarrassment and problem and yet he never disappeared. The, the rule didn't carry out with him. He didn't disappear at midnight. So it was quite a, a, a wonderment to a lot of people why it was that he was able to be such an embarrassment to the government and still survive. Well, there's a very simple answer to that. It turned out that this guy was absolutely loved 
by everyone, even his enemies. They didn't want to hurt him. <laughs> okay? They didn't want to hurt him at all. I mean, yeah, it was a pain, but, but they liked him. Well, there's an important principle here. Make your enemy love you. Okay? You go into court, you treat these guys nice. You say, hi, how are you? You, you, uh, you say hello to the clerks, you know, you talk about other friendly things, you know. Some people develop good friendships with the clerks, all right? They get to know you and you'd be surprised how they file stuff in that otherwise they might not. And, uh, they'll, uh, if you, you try to, you try to make it a friendly atmosphere. I know the moment you turn your back on them, they're going to stab you. Okay? I mean, that's a given. But, you still be friendly with him because it might turn out that the reason he's, he's a, uh, whoever it is is giving you a problem is because he may be forced to carry out some sort of policy that's unwritten. At least it's not available to us. Okay? Yeah. So, um, if, if, he's, if he's doing that, uh, he he's going to resist carrying out those policies to their fullest if he likes you, whoever that person may be. So, uh, there's, there's, you see, in every system, whether it's a legal system, a computer system, you know, business system, in every system, there's a hidden informal system behind it. And there's a lot of communication that goes on. You know, you don't know, it might be that the clerk's uh, husband is a good friend of one of the judges. It happens. Okay? I knew a guy who was a mechanic. And somebody made the mistake of suing him. Like the person that sued him had no idea that this guy maintained all of the judges BMWs and Mercedes. Okay? And he had informal conversations and one of the judges said, ah, don't worry about that guy. Okay? Show up in court but don't say anything. Okay? The guy showed up in court and the judge took care of it, looked very neutral. They had no idea that guy, the, whoever that plaintiff was, he had no idea that connection was there. I knew it because I was told. And, uh, but you see, the guy had a bogus case anyway. But what a difference it made if the judge knew you were a good guy and the other guys are bogus. You know, so there's more to law than just law. So I want you to understand this, is that you need to, you got to remember that in court, you gotta, you've got to um, develop these social relationships. Maybe you don't feel very sociable going in there, but you still got to do it. It's very, very important. The world, you know, many, many decisions are made out on the golf course, okay, not in the meetings. This is a, this is a fact of the business world, and believe me, the court system is part of the business world. You don't know who drinks with who down at the, the corner pub. Okay? So, if you're one of the good guys and you're not somebody who's causing trouble but instead just simply trying to assert your, your rights and, and, uh, and don't be afraid to yield a point sometimes. Uh, for the, you know, lose the battle to win the war. That's okay too. You know, there, there was a Russian general that uh, used that technique against the French when they were invading Russia. And uh, his young lieutenants wanted to attack, but the strongest army in the world at that time was the French army. There's no way that Napoleon's army could be beaten. So what he did is he just burned all the land, you know, all the land, all the crops everywhere. The only way that Napoleon could supply his troops was with long supply lines all the way back to France. And as they went further or farther and farther into Russia, the lines got longer and more and more personnel had to be devoted to that, to the transport instead of to the, the business of fighting. And then of course there was a little guerrilla warfare in there where they'd harass the troops at night so they didn't get a good rest. And they, they, the French troops actually made it up to the edge of Moscow. Okay? And then winter came. <laughs> and they weren't equipped for that. And I'll tell you something, a lot of French soldiers stayed there, the ones that lived through the winter, stayed there, and many words in Russia now are French in origin. 
Okay? So, uh, and it was all based on the idea of, of basically retreating, making it as tough for the enemy as possible, but retreating, retreating, and treating, and then the war was lost by Napoleon. Okay? Thought he was winning all those battles, but he actually lost the war. So, um, you, you, there, when you do your, your strategy, you gotta look at that. Alright, let's, uh, let's go into the subject of sovereignty. If you're satisfied with, uh, everybody's satisfied with what to say in court, how to deal with the judge. Bill, can you run that counterclaim thing again? Okay, you want me to re-explain the counterclaim? Just briefly. Okay. Uh, it, it basically, it, you, what I would do is I would do it anyway. Because, see, <coughs> ignorance, Ignorance is everywhere. I mean, the attorneys don't know, the clerks don't know, the judges don't know the things that they should know. And so, um, you really should have a counterclaim <laughs> timely, but, hey, put it in anyway. What are they gonna do? Throw it out? Well, then they'll have to explain themselves if they throw it out, okay? And then, and basically you file your counterclaim uh, I think it's a little late to file your counterclaim after the judgment, okay? But any time before then, uh, you could try it. Uh, I think in reality you should have your counterclaim in within a month after their claim reaches you, after you're served, okay? And their claim's supposed to stop until they prove their jurisdiction, prove that they had jurisdiction in your 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 counterclaim and one more thing and that is that a counterclaim the way you put it together is identical to an original lawsuit the only difference is is that you, you've changed the name counterclaim and you're doing it on jurisdiction the fact that you're challenging jurisdiction is what stops them okay what if they have a trial in absentia what if they have a trial in absentia that should never occur that should never occur. You should always show up for these things. Failure, you see, there's a rule in the court that basically says that if you fail to object, it means you agree. If you're not there to object, you're agreeing. That simple. Okay, they have a trial in absentia it's because they acquire jurisdiction. Once they get that in personam jurisdiction, they don't care if you show up or not. They say they care, but the truth is is that the, the trial will go on. You're stuck. I would never not appear. I always appear on everything, okay? However, the conditions of my appearance are a little different. For example, you have a, if you have a counterclaim in, why am I there? Okay? The reason I'm there is because my, my court isn't open, right on top of their court. And if they do anything to extend their jurisdiction, you object because they are misbehaving in front of your court. That's a contempt of court, by the way. And you can find them for contempt of court. Okay, we did it once. The fine was too high though, and he never paid it. We fined him a dollar. Okay, but he never really got a chance to, to pay it because the presiding judge yanked him off and they brought in a real top gun to deal with us who understood common law. So that's why we never enforced it. We would have enforced it if he had stayed. You have to understand what contempt of court is. Contempt of court only has two purposes. The first purpose is to preserve the dignity of the court and the second purpose is to preserve the authority of the court. Okay? When that judge got removed, he was no longer a threat to either the dignity or the authority of the court. Therefore, the uh, contempt issue became moot. No longer existed. That's why we didn't enforce it. Yes, sir? Uh, Bill, in uh, the case of, uh, I guess I'll call it the IRS tax court, which is in Washington, D.C., how do you the IRS, present yourself? The, the IRS tax court is your court. You are the moving party in an IRS tax court, from what I understand. Even though they say it's administrative, you're the plaintiff and they are the defense, right? You've made the charge, whatever it is, 